Um, should we go ahead and get started? Okay, so uh, welcome. Hello, everyone today. Hopefully it is sunny where you are, it is sunny where I'm at. Um, welcome to our first conversation on access, Black disability activism. Uh, captioning has been enabled for this event. So to access those captions, uh, most of you are probably familiar with this, but down at the bottom of your Zoom window, there is the show captions button there, which will uh, have that enabled for you. Uh, we're gonna start today with a land acknowledgement. Uh, so hello everyone, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Heather Hill, and I'm a settler immigrant on the land that we currently call Canada. I'm talking to you today from my home near Western University in London, Ontario, uh, which is situated on the traditional territories of the Anishinaabek, the Haudenosaunee, the Lunapawak, and the Chnantan nations on lands connected with the London Township and Somber Treaties of 1796, and the dish with one spoon covenant wampum. On this land is the Thames River, though I think the Anishinaabek name of the Deshkan Zibi is our Antler River, is a better descriptive name for the river as it winds through the city that we live in. It's a place that I find to be of solace and reflection, but for the Oneida Nation of the Thames, the Deshkan Zibi is a source of their drinking water, but it's unsafe. The community, which is about a half an hour from here, has been under a boil advisory order since 2019. And they're not the only indigenous community that lacks clean water in Canada. Autumn Peltier is an Anishinaabe water protector from the Wigwemekong First Nation. As chief water protector of the Anishinaabe Nation, she works and advocates for clean water across Canada and internationally. Her work is inspired from her great aunt, Elder Josephine Mandeman, who passed away in 2019. Uh, before she passed, uh, she walked 25,000 kilometers around the Great Lakes, around the shores to bring awareness to the need to protect our drinking water from pollution. I am grateful today to be able to reside on these lands and I continue to learn from the work of people like Josephine and Autumn on how to be a better guest here. Thank you. Thanks so much, Heather. Uh, hello and welcome, everybody. My name is Sarah Smith, and I'm the Canada Research Chair in Art, Culture, and Global Relations at Western University. It's really my pleasure to welcome you today and to introduce you to the series Conversations on Access. Today's discussion on Black disability activism is the first in a series of three conversations on access that are being hosted this year by the Faculty of Information and Media Studies. Our next conversations are set to take place in May and September, and we really hope you'll return and join us on these future occasions. These conversations are organized by a team in the Faculty of Information and Media Studies comprised of Heather Hill, and Juan Escobar Lamana, as well as myself. So we're both faculty and graduate students in FIMS. And our intention with this series, Conversations on Access, is to foreground access as a tangible lived experience, going beyond an approach to access as solely a topic of research. This focus is emphasized through our selection of speakers who include artists, activists, practitioners, as well as scholars. And each of the three conversations aims to initiate a broader discussion that engages the public. So forging new networks and virtual communities while also engaging students, staff and faculty here at Western University. The events employ the format of a conversation to allow for and encourage dialogue, connections, critical reflections and discussion that supports care and the building of community, as well as one that aims to inform our approach and actions here in London and at Western University. Before going any further, I'd like to acknowledge uh, with a lot of gratitude the support for this event from the Faculty of Information and Media Studies, as well as from the Canada Research Chairs Program. And we'd also like to extend specific thanks to Dean Henderson for her support of this series, to Matt Ward for his help with the Zoom webinar and registration, and to Becky Blue for her work on the communication and promotion of this event. There we go. So today we're thrilled to introduce our two panelists. Uh, joining us are Melissa Thompson and Dr. Sammy Schalk. Melissa Thompson is a licensed master social worker from Winsboro, South Carolina. 
She's the founder and CEO of Ramp Your Voice, which is an organization focused on promoting self-advocacy and strengthening empowerment among disabled people. Being a disability rights consultant, writer, and activist affords Valissa the opportunity to be a prominent leader and expert in addressing and educating the public and political figures about the plight of disabled people, and especially Black women and femmes with disability. Um, we were going to post, oh, there we go. Uh, they're going to put in the chat. Um, you can find more about Ramp Your Voice and also Valissa's Twitter handle. And our other panelist, Dr. Shami, Sammy Schalk, is an associate professor of gender and women's studies at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Her interdisciplinary research focuses broadly on disability, race, and gender in contemporary American literature and culture. She has published on literature, film, and material culture in a variety of peer-reviewed humanities journals. Dr. Schalk's books include Body Minds Reimagined, Disability, Race, and Gender in Black Woman Speculative Fiction, which was published by Duke University Press in 2018. And more recently, in 2022, she published Black Disability Politics, also with Duke University Press. And it looks like chat is now working for everyone, which is amazing. And again, we're going to post in the chat um, Sam's website where you can learn more about her work and also same thing, her Twitter handle. Uh, welcome, Sammy. Welcome, Valissa. Uh, today's conversation focuses on Black disability activism. So our aim is to trouble the dominance of whiteness in disability activism and to explore Black disability activism and disability justice by drawing on the experiences and knowledge of our speakers. Our conversation will address topics in disability studies, including self-identification, the binary framing of disability and non-disability, and also include discussion of the approaches we can take to advancing accessibility in different communities and institutions. Our format today is structured to feature the experiences and ideas of our speakers, Sammy and Melissa. We have prepared some questions for them to respond to, and we'll also hold space for audience engagement. Uh, we'll be adding comments and information periodically now that the chat is working, we're set with that. Uh, but you are also welcome to comment in the chat at any time. If you have specific questions that you would like our speakers to, to address at some point. Oh, and there's a Teddy on the screen. Okay, sorry, I'm excited. Um, if you have questions specifically for our speakers that you're hoping that they'll address in our time together today, uh, please put those in the Q&A section and I'll be keeping an eye on those for a little later on and bringing those, those questions forward for you. Um, and we'll get to those a little closer to 1 p.m. Uh, with that note, let us start with our question. Yeah, I'm so excited to begin. Uh, and we wanted to start the conversation uh, by acknowledging that whiteness has claimed a great deal of space in disability activism. And so in thinking about uh, both of your uh, work and experiences, uh, Melissa, in addition to your large body of work around disability justice, in 2016, you started the hashtag disability to white, which brought attention to the lack of diversity within representations of disability, but as well as the lack of diversity in discussions around disability. And Sammy, uh, your work on Black disability politics, you've written that Black cultural workers have engaged disability as a social and political issue differently than the mainstream white dominated disability rights movement. So we thought a great starting place would be to ask you to talk to us about how disability justice and an understanding of Black disability politics changes our understanding about the nature of accessibility. And I'm not sure who'd like to jump in and speak first, uh, but I'll just allow you both to unmute as you like. I would like Sammy to go first, kind of center the book a little bit, if you don't mind, Sammy. Sure, absolutely. Um, hey, y'all. Um, I'm Sammy. I just as an image description, I'm a fat, light skinned Black woman wearing a pink dress, uh, green glasses, green bouncy ball earrings, and a multicolored head wrap. And every once in a while, there will be a cat that jumps onto the back of my chair because that's what she likes to do. Um, so you may see Madame Alice here every once in a while. Um, so sorry, can you say the question again? I got cat distracted. Um, <laughs> Understandable. Yeah. 
We wanted to start by talking about uh, the elephant in the room, whiteness has claimed so much space in disability activism. And we were thinking about both of your works, so Alyssa's hashtag disability too white, as well as uh, what you've written about how Black cultural workers have engaged disability as a social and political issue differently than, uh, say, mainstream white-dominated disability rights movement. So the question is just if you could speak to us, drawing on your research and experience about how disability justice and understanding Black disability politics could change our uh, approach to or grasp of the nature of accessibility. Sure. Um, so for the book, it's it's historically based and contemporary. So I do interviews with contemporary Black disabled activists like Lissa, um, as well as look at um, the work of the Black Panther Party and the National Black Women's Health Project. And what I found in doing the work in, and having been doing work in Black disability studies for a while is one of the big differences in the way that Black folks identify with and engage with disability um, comes from the fact that our the way that disability shows up in Black communities is sometimes different. Um, there's a lot of disability that comes from things like medical neglect, um, from medical racism, from police violence. And so because of that, a lot of the times the way that Black activists and organizers talk about disability, it's framed within or underneath the umbrella of anti-Black violence. And so because of that, it gets kind of obscured in the way that people think that Black people are or are not talking about disability because they see like, oh, you're talking about police brutality. But actually within that, we're talking about disability. Um, so what I found is that a lot of folks, even if they understand that they have a disability, they may not identify as having a disability or they may have been denied access to certain kind of state and legal or medical recognition of disability which limits their their access to access <laughs> like it limits their ability to get access through the legal means that we have um so you know here in the US under the ADA in a lot of places you need a medical diagnosis you need doctor documentation of what you need to prove here's what i need and then you probably still have to fight to get it so if we have a situation like we do in the US where people don't have access to quality health care and it is worse for Black people, then they are not going to have the documentation in the same way, let alone the same kind of engagement with disability community um, that white folks might have or even just folks with more class privilege. Um, so really what we're seeing is the interaction with race and class and disability, and then of course like cultural structures that make it less likely that Black folks will have access to the same kinds of accessibility supports, um, which also means that they may not be engaged in the politics in the same way, they may not be engaged in the community in the same way as a result, because if, you know, if the state and the doctors are saying, well, you're not disabled enough to count, then why would someone be like, I'm disabled and claim that as an identity if they're being told from other sources that they don't qualify um, for that. So, you know, the disability justice movement really expands beyond this understanding that disability is defined by the state, <laughs> um, is, that disability is defined by an inability to work, which is really the way it's defined here, um, and expands it to understand our relationship to these like structure and cultural norms and expectations of bodies and minds. Um, and, you know, disability justice folks, we don't say like, show me your paperwork to be a part of this movement. That's not how this works. Thank you. And Felissa. Yes. Uh, this is Felissa. I am a light skinned Black woman who is sitting in her wheelchair. I have on a dark gray long sleeve shirt. Uh, silver hoop earrings, rectangular shaped glasses, and my hair is pulled back and hanging down, and I have a sunny yellow background. And for me, when I think about this question, it, it reminds me of the changes that I have seen when it comes to discussing disability issues from, a, and from an intentional intersectional lens since I've been doing this work for 10 years now. And when I began this work, it was very apparent to me that our resistance in the community to discuss anything other than disability was, was incredibly harmful. You know, when the hashtag that you mentioned came about, that was the first time in my life that I was called the N-word 
because of white disabled folks and non-disabled whites. I mean, non-disabled um, white folks really, you know, was upset that anyone has the audacity to bring these issues together, racism, anti-Blackness, misogyny, and war, you know, um, anti-Asian, you know, sentiments and so forth, bringing it together and connecting it to the movement. So when I think about our ability to talk about Black disability politics, you know, it is, it's, to some people, still radical to even say those things. You know, because there has been this resistance. When you look at this political history, you know, you hear the white faces and names always uttered, but you rarely hear black disabled leadership like Johnny Lacey and so forth like that, who were pioneers, particularly of the independent living movement of the 70s and 80s, you know, heard. Or you think about the involvement of bridging movements, such as what Brad Lomax did with who was a Black disabled Panther um, who connected the Black Panther Party to the 504 sit-ins that happened in San Francisco. So we see how this erasure, this inability, this resistance of connecting race and disability movements and history allows for people who have a right to be known within the same vein as their white counterparts, them being left out, them being omitted. And it takes individuals like myself and Sammy to push their names forward. And it's not just our quote unquote burden to do so. It's not our role and only job to do so. So in talking about black disability politics, that is still a very new concept for this community that has not wanted to discuss anything outside of disability and have failed those of us of color and other marginalized identities in this space who understand that our intersectional identities matter. You cannot look at me as a Black disabled woman and not understand how any, any of my identities may impact my quality of life, the opportunities that I have, how I navigate the space, you know, how I navigate disability spaces, how I navigate Black spaces. That is not okay to do. And that has led to some of the resistance that Sammy had mentioned about people wanting to identify as disabled. Because when you don't see yourself, but then you're being told that you cannot talk about these issues that matter, then why would you want to identify as something when it's when it's seemingly shameful to do so? When you're trying to speak your truth and speak your stories as powerful as they should be. So I think that the great thing about disability justice is that it already encompasses intersectionality. It already encompasses the ways that say people can be multiply marginalized and the multiple identities we can have. But there's still some to me, lack of education within the community about the difference between disability rights and disability justice and what disability justice actually is. And that ignorance, that lack of education is allowing us to still carry over the same ills that has harmed our ancestors of the movement and those of us who are present day forward and creates this division between, you know, white disabled folks, disabled people of color, you know, from really being able to engage in honest and truthful conversations about what is really happening for us. You know, as I always say, just because we're disabled doesn't mean we experience disability the same way. And that is, you know, incredibly true. But when you have movements, you know, leadership that don't want to acknowledge that reality and then give space for those of us who are living these marginalized experiences, the, the room and the opportunity to discuss these things and not just talking about them, but also be leaders in informal policy, things that can change some of these you know, systemic barriers that Sammy mentioned, then what is truly the role of movement? You know, how are we actually progressing this world, this country and this world for everyone and not just the privilege for you that always get ahead? and always leave those of us behind. So, um, oh, oh, sorry, sorry. I was go just ahead. gonna add, yeah, yeah. Um, I just also wanna lift up um, Dennis Billups, B-I-L-L-U-P-S, um, which is an error in my book. The name is spelled wrong in the book, but it's gonna be corrected in the next printing. Um, but he was a part of the 504 sit-in. <laughs> 
a blind black man. And um, his name was has really been a race from leadership. And he is still living, he's still in the Bay Area. Um, and he did an, an interview, an oral history, and really, you know, was disappointed at the way that he has been erased um, from the history of the 504. And we really only hear the names of white leaders um, who were prioritized and being interviewed in newspapers, you know, all these things that then make them kind of last into um, the longer history. Thanks for putting that in the chat. Um, so I wanted to, to lift up his name um, and also just say that I think a lot of what um, you know, Black disabled organizers and activists and disability justice activists are doing is learning from um, other sorts of intersectional movements. And so it reminds me a lot of early Black feminist movements where Black women were being told, you're Black first. Or it, within the women's uh, liberation movement, they were being told like, well, we'll get to that race stuff later, but first we have to handle the gender stuff, right? And I think we're seeing similar things that are happening um, for Black disabled people where within Black liberation work, we're being told, oh, we'll get to the accessibility stuff, or that's kind of too hard for us to do, but we do care, we'll get to it, we'll get to it. Um, and then white disabled folks being like, well, disability is the thing that people, you know, that's the most important thing because whatever the reason <laughs> that they say that, right? So this idea that we can rank our um, oppressions or separate our oppressions, um, we see the way that Black feminists have, have resisted that and formed other kind of movements and approaches. Um, um, so I think that a lot of this work is learning from the history of, of Black women. Black women are always leading the way, is basically what always. you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, no, that's fantastic. And I think along the lines of sort of hard and fast legal definitions of disability that you kind of were both talking about, um, the next question we wanted to ask was about the binary of disabled and non-disabled um, and how in institutions, including in universities, there is an increasing sort of attempt to account for disability and trying to track it, acknowledge it in perhaps a well-intentioned bid to create an accessible environment. But of course, this contradicts our understanding of disability as a very fluid concept. And Sammy, in your book, you note that the division between disabled and non-disabled is unstable, permeable, and socially, historically, and contextually defined. So what do you both think about how we can sort of break out of this binary understanding of disabled and non-disabled? How can we disrupt or break the binary to acknowledge a more complex understanding of disability as something that's not always yes or no, but instead is a state that we may come in and out of? I'll start with that one. I think that in my work, when I do trainings, you know, I always try to get people to realize that your disability story, the way that you present, matters and for acts of person this is violence of talking i'm sorry um and i think that's so important you know when we have these stringent you know categories and definitions folks who may not present a certain way due to the way that their disability or chronic illness or so forth manifest they hesitate to identify i was having this exact conversation for a podcast that I did recently from the host who just got recently diagnosed with ADHD. She's a Black film, and she was hesitating to share that because you were like, well, my, you know, I have this new diagnosis and I'm still learning and this and that. I'm like, but you're still disabled. It doesn't matter if you got, quote unquote, you know, officially diagnosed yesterday or, you know, been you know, diagnose your whole life or even self-diagnosis, which is very valid as well. You're still a part of the community. Your voice, your perspective matters. So I think that when we have these very binary guidelines on, you know, that centers on just accommodations or just the definitions and so forth, people really take that and internalize it. And that can create an unsafe thing of internalized ableism, like, oh, I'm not disabled enough, or people aren't going to believe me when I say that I need X, Y, Z support because I look, quote, unquote, healthy. I look, quote, unquote, normal. And I think that's the thing that I encounter a lot in my work, particularly from Black women films who are coming to their disability identity later in life, since many of us go undiagnosed or undiagnosed, you know, for so long. And I think that's the real tragedy is that people 
you know, feel this disconnection when they want connection. And I think that's the major thing that I find in my work. People want to be in community with other people that look like them, particularly if you are of color and disabled. You know, they want that community. And these guidelines just really create this, you know, unfair barrier for them to even see themselves in their fullness and their wholeness. So that's really what I encounter a lot in my training to just getting people to be comfortable with, you know, attaching themselves to identity that they want to be attached to. I don't find a lot of resistance from people who, you know, at least in the spaces that I'm in, you know, who want to be detached, but they're trying to figure out how they fit perfectly. And there's no perfect fit, you know, in this identity. And I think that's the thing that I always try to share with people that how you present is perfect enough. And you're good enough to self-identify, you know, and be a part of this space and just make it, making it your own. And I just see people when they're affirmed in that way, they just feel such a relief, you know? And I think that's the thing that always catches me when I do this type of work. And I think that's what makes it for me accessible. Just getting people get to that first step, you know, that first point, and then they can just shoot forward you know, with the confidence that they need to really embrace this identity, particularly as Black folks, since, you know, many of us already don't want to, quote unquote, add one more thing to our plate, you know, in a world that already degrades us for being Black. And when you have a identity like being disabled, that is already misunderstood just as it is being Black, then that's a double whammy for somebody to take on. So for me, Destroying the binary is so important so that people can navigate life in full. You know, they can navigate life in a way that, you know, is empowering, you know, and not shameful. And kind of going into, you know, kind of making things more accessible, getting not to say folks to realize that universal designs and accessible tools like captioning and ramps and things of that nature, that's for you too. You know, like getting these things to become a place for them to think about in that work. You know, if you're hosting an event, you know, virtually, think about, oh, we're going to need captioning. We're going to need ASL, making it a part of their routine, just as setting a Zoom up or anything like that. That is what, you know, in the spaces that I'm in, I'm trying to get people to understand is that these accessibility tools are not just for disabled folks. They're for all of us, because we all may have certain needs that we want to ensure that, you know, we're able to engage in effectively and without the least amount of barriers. So I think that the binary harms both non-disabled people and disabled folks. And it's on us to really getting both groups to see how you have a place in this and a stake in this, whether it's being comfortable with your disability identity and embracing that and finding community or being more intentional about how you are inclusive of folks you know, in the spaces that you're in. Thank you for that. Um, thinking about a lot of things, but um, so the divide between disability and ability or non-disabled and disabled, I talk about as being permeable because, um, you know, our bodies are constantly changing. Our contexts are constantly changing. Um, you know, when I'm here at home, I can be very low pain, but when I'm on the road and traveling and moving through airports, I get wheelchair assistance. And, you know, there's other things that have to happen depending on what I need my body to do (laughs) in a particular moment. Um, So for me, as somebody with chronic pain, that feels very clear um, that when I have more and less capacity just depends on the day and the context that I'm in. Um, And I think, you know, neither of us are saying like, everyone's disabled, like it's not to that extent, right? But we are all, we, we have differential needs. Um, I'm thinking about the work of Mimi Cook, um, who she has a book coming out next year. um, But she talks about we that what if we approached our, you know, our society and and communities as everyone is unwell, but we are differentially unwell. Um, So that we all have needs. That is just what it is to be a human. We have needs um, that have to be met by other people because 
none of us are making our own clothes and growing our own food and I don't know, making electricity happen. Other people are fulfilling our needs. Um, And so how do we move towards a space where we just acknowledge that there are different kinds of needs um, and some of those are more bodily or mental than others um, that doesn't require us to, again, like have these certain kinds of state recognitions. Um, I think about, um, oh gosh, T.L. Lewis, uh, Melissa, uh, T.L. Lewis works with not three fifths. What's, what's his real name? Um, Dustin, Dustin. Oh my gosh. Thank you. (laughs) It's like, it's, I just could see the Twitter handle. Um, so Dustin Gibson in the book, um, one of the things he said was, you know, I don't care if you identify as disabled or not, but if you're diabetic, I want you to have access to insulin, right? Like I want you to have the things that you need. And I think that that's kind of the shift that this challenging of the, the, non-disabled disabled line is doing is saying we all have needs and whether or not you meet this threshold that has been arbitrarily set by the state um defined by politics right like when the ADA and the the Rehabilitation Act of 1973 here in the U.S. were passed there were fights over who counts do alcoholics count do folks with addiction count do folks with HIV count right all these ways that they're saying yes no yes no you count you don't count by politicians not people who have these conditions not other disabled people right um so I think it's important for us to remember that these uh regulations that are set up are set up by the state. They are set up to purposefully exclude and to save money, right? That it is about, well, we can't imagine supporting everybody. Um, So, I mean, my approach is very anti-capitalist and anti-state, which may not be a practical solution, but um, I do believe that having access to things of the things that you need um, without having to constantly prove it is really important um, because, There are times where I think for a lot of us, we push ourselves past a certain point because we're like, well, I could do that, right? I could push myself to do this thing. And then just like, maybe I'll be in pain for the next three days, but I can do it. So if the access is not there, I'll just push through. And having more accessible worlds allows us to not push through. And I want us to imagine what it would be like when we have our needs met in an accessible world and what else we are able to do when we are not spending so much of our time and energy surviving in accessible, hostile worlds. And that is not just physically, right? That's also these attitudinal environments. It's the way that people, you know, look at me when I get wheelchair assistance and then stand up and walk to the bathroom, you know, that's like, yeah, I can walk this, but I can't move across an entire airport with all my stuff in the 10 minutes that I have on this layover. Um, So all of these things impact the way that we make choices to move through the world. And so really challenging the idea that like, well, I'm not disabled, so I shouldn't take things or use things that would help me that push to able-bodiedness to really challenge that for all of us, whether we are disabled or not, because disabled people also push themselves to move towards able-bodiedness, right? Um, I think it starts to help take down that system um, and to stop pushing our bodies so hard. Um, and I think that this is especially important in the in the wake of a pandemic. So many of us are increasingly disabled, whether that is directly because of COVID infections and long COVID or other things that have exper- we've experienced, either that's lack of access to medical care because hospitals were shut down and inaccessible, uh, lack of access to community, um, grief that we didn't have our typical grieving processes, all these things that have made more and more of us experience disability in different ways. I think it is really an important time for us to start challenging this idea that everyone is able-bodied until you're not, um, because we actually all have a lot of needs. And I think more people coming into recognizing that and owning that um, will be useful in our future, increasingly disabled world. And the point that I would add to that, when you think about COVID and long COVID, is people's understanding, at least here in the States, how broken our systems are, the quote unquote safety nets we're supposed to have. And I think that is probably the first introduction to breaking the binary is not, you know, former non-disabled folks, 
who are now disabled due to COVID, you know, are realizing, oh gosh, there is nothing really in place that can help me survive this new reality, particularly if you are not able to work anymore. You know, particularly if you need support, you need certain resources and realizing that these safety nets do anything but. And disabled folks, particularly those of us like myself who used to be on, you know, certain benefits or are still on them, knew that this whole time, which is why we've been trying to fight for expansion of Medicaid and, you know, so forth of that nature. So I think that, you know, some of the chipping away of the binary is happening now in not dis- formerly not disabled folks' understanding of the way that our work here in the U.S. works. And it doesn't work well at all. And I'm very interested in seeing how do these newly disabled people will first join the movement and then push forward to get these programs and these systems to actually work? What is that going to look like 10, 20 years from now when we're looking at the realities of COVID on not just the workforce, but just our society as a whole? That is something that, you know, my researcher brain is kind of curious about as to how is the shaping of disability is going to be impacted due to the needs of those who are newly disabled and what would be the responsibility of our politicians to answer or continue to ignore the calls for change. Yeah. I want to add one more thing to bring um, kind of Blackness into this conversation um, because I've just been going on these same rants um, the whole book tour. But um, so... At this point, the most recent data for the U.S., I I learned recently that Canada doesn't necessarily keep these same kind of stats on like comparative race and disability kind of stuff. So, but in the U.S., they're saying that one in three people um, end up with long COVID. That's an incredibly high chance. Um, So one of the three folks end up with long COVID, which means you're experiencing COVID symptoms of some sort after effects three months after infection. So if it's been three months, you still have it that begins the sense of having long COVID. And it can be a lot of things that folks are experiencing from that. Um, But black folks are most likely to have long COVID and black and Latino folks. And what that says to me is that we have lack of access to quality healthcare quick, right? Which, Which means things like access to Paxlovid, early treatment and care. It also means that we're experiencing more medical racism when we might do seek treatment, do seek um, support for long COVID. And it also is a sign of the fact that Black folks are more likely to have um, manual labor jobs, jobs that have less flexibility. So there's less time to actually rest and recover. And that is the main thing that people need for for surviving and recovering from COVID is rest, time to genuinely do nothing. And the more layers of oppression that you add onto a person's life, the less likely they're going to have access to rest. Um, And so when we're talking about this being like, I say a mass disabling disabling event, it is most impacting people of color. So we're going to see more black and brown people disabled, even as we are also seeing a lot more white folks disabled um, as well. So I just want to add that into our understanding of like what that means of who is becoming disabled. Um, And I also think that this period of like lockdown and a lot of work from home, virtual work has also made more people just realize that they're disabled, that they're like, oh, actually when I don't have to go into work and like mask in front of a bunch of people or walk across campus or be moving around, I am better. I am in less pain. I am less stressed out. Like actually I might be disabled. So I also think just having a shift for a moment allowed some people to realize oh, I've been kind of faking it and pushing through. And this made me realize how different it could be. Thank you both so much for your response to that. And in in thinking about what you were saying, um, I've just finished uh, Trisha Hersey's Rest is Resistance, which Mm -hmm. is an amazing book that I'm trying to um, see if I can bring that into my own practice and even into my, my teaching. Um, My my question kind of segues us into uh, higher education, walking across campus, Sammy, as you said. Um, Higher education has historically excluded many of those with disabilities, uh, you know, for all the reasons we've been talking about so far today, uh, which limits the voices that are privileged within academia. Um, So we wanted to ask, 
what your thoughts are on what we can do to better privilege those voices with lived experience of disability that may not be technically a part of the academy and voices that represent ongoing efforts and activism within the field. I can start. This is Valosa. I had this, I brought this up um, a couple of days ago for a chat that I did for someone's class and it's a graduate level social work students. And when I talk to students who will have direct engagement with the community, with the disabled community through that work, um, such as social work and so forth like that, I always let them know that you have an acquired knowledge of the experiences of the people that you may work with. And that is something that you have to always uphold when you are out in the field. The voices of your clients, whether they're disabled, whether they're of color, you know, whether they are, you know, immigrants, whatever, they have the authoritative knowledge. They have the knowledge that you need to be a better, competent, inclusive, accessible practitioner. And I think that's something that, particularly in our programs, we fail our prospective um, colleagues to understand that yes, you are you are in your programs for two, four years or more. But when you are working with communities, especially those who will be out in the field, you have to understand your place in that. Particularly if you are white, particularly if you are able-bodied, not disabled, you really have to understand your privileges when you're going out into spaces where people may not look like you. And you have to understand the hesitation of engaging with people that look like you for these groups. And the same thing happens with disabled folks. You know, we have a lot of our disability organizations that are, you know, ran sometimes by non-disabled folks who now some organization may be ran by disabled folks, but they are white. So you have to understand the resistance and the hesitation to engage with these systems that have not always been welcoming to those who need their supports and services that they offer. And I think that taking a critical lens and bringing that perspective into our programs when we are serving people is so important because we having folks coming out in the field with all these privileges and bi you know, biases, you know, whether, you know, implicit or explicit, and they're doing a whole lot of harm. You know, when I talk about some in my work about the role of social workers and doctors and nurses and how they engage with disabled folks in certain settings, it can be very startling for certain people to really understand how people in the field are being harmful. You know, for example, you know, the right to parent is still a very contentious issue, you know, in America, and I'm certain it's the same in Canada. You know, we have a lot of social workers and doctors and nurses who discriminate against disabled parents, simply for being disabled. You know, social workers are utilized to, you know, be cops, you know, in a way of policing a disabled person's right to parent. You know, there are a plethora of research and articles of disabled people who have had their children removed from them just because they're disabled, not due to any neglect or suspected abuse or anything like that. And I think that's a problem. When we talk about higher education, we are not giving students the real understanding of what their position of power means for them to be of these authority figures. And what does it mean when you engage with communities that have a true historical hesitation and harm, you know, associated with people who do your job. And I think that's the one thing that, you know, I always, when I'm in settings, when I'm talking to students, you know, that's what I try to drive home. I'm like, you have a great responsibility when you say that you're a social worker or whatever, or a teacher or whomever, and to really understand the power in that, the power that you have to, you know, potentially affect somebody's life forever based on how you perceive them. You perceive their capabilities and the quality of life of their worthiness of getting the support that you're supposed to be utilizing and also realizing the ethics that you uphold that no matter what title that you have is always there. Like I'm a macro social worker, so I'm not working with clients in that way, but I still have a code of ethics as a social worker that I uphold that goes well beyond any hat or any organization or any agency that I may engage with. And that rules how I engage, even in this setting, about how I engage with people, how I engage in the work that I do. And that is, to me, the guiding light 
you know, from many of us. So I think higher education and how I'm looking at it from my view have a very um, big priority to, for people who actually do work that engages the community directly to really let the students know what that responsibility means and understanding the realities of that in the roles that you have. And the second vein, when it comes to higher ed, making the information that some of us may want to utilize to make sure that our practices are competent and up-to-date accessible. There's so much research being done in higher ed that is behind paywalls and you know things of that nature that cannot be accessed. And it's so mind-boggling because you all do all this research you know, you study these things for years and no one knows about what you're studying unless they also have a PhD or they also have access to these journals and things of that nature. How, you know, incredibly inaccessible that is for people who are on the ground, quote unquote, doing the work, wanting better practices, wanting their work to be inclusive and updated. They can't access it because they don't have a certain title, they don't have certain connections. So I think higher ed has a reckoning within itself to ensure that the information that is being done in the Ivy Towers and other institutions are accessible for all to engage with and not just you know, certain titles. I know with Sammy's book, you know, it was very important for her to make sure there's open access, you know, like open source so that people regardless of their ability to pay or engage with the information, can get it. And I think there needs to be more intentionality within higher ed to make the information that you're doing. Please, you know, find ways to skirt around the paywalls and the rules and really ensure that everyday people can have access to them, to this. It shouldn't be this, you know, um, this or us type of mentality when it comes to basic information. Um, thanks for mentioning the the open access book. It is indeed open access. Maybe somebody can drop that into the chat too. Um, so both of my books are open access now. Um, and yes, it was an important part for me, but not just in it being open access, but also in the way that I write. Um, because again, that like very jargony language doesn't help very many people. So I want to start with just building off of what Vilissa just said. Um, because I think some folks are like, well, what do I do, right? Um, I think especially I'll speak to if, if there are like tenure track folks in, in the room who were like, well, I got to publish. Um, I put everything on my website. I just do. And it's never been a problem. No one has like found it and been like, you got to take that down. So that's one thing. Um, I've also, you know, tweeted out Dropbox links where it is available. Um, I just put things out into the world. And another way of doing it is to say, okay, I've published this article that really need to speak to my specific field with my jargon and all the things, but I can put up a YouTube video. I can put up a blog post that summarizes these findings in a really accessible, plain language kind of way. You can still share work after it's been published in other kinds of ways. And I think that sometimes for academics, we get so stuck on what the CV looks like and filling those CV lines and forgetting that the whole point is to create and share knowledge. That is the point of what we do, create and share knowledge. And it's not just about, for me, citations. But even if you're, you're worried about citations, if you have published it in one journal and then you're just waiting for people to find it, that's not how people are going to find your work. You have to put it out there. And the more accessible you make it, the more people are going to read it, the more likely people are going to cite it, the more likely people are going to invite you for talks and do all all these other things, put it on their syllabus, right? So it actually benefits you <laughs> to make your work accessible. And despite all the things that you might sign and say to all your publishing people, most likely Routledge is not checking to see if you put your paper somewhere for free online. Ain't nobody checking for it. Nobody cares. Um, so don't be afraid to break rules. That's just like, activism 101, break some rules. Um, so I'll say that. But then in terms of other ways of like making higher ed more accessible and bringing disability and disabled folks into the academy more, um, for me, one of the things that I've done is really 
identify as disabled in spaces, right? In my classroom, in uh, faculty meetings, like wherever I can to talk about it, because I think a lot of us, if we don't have a visible disability, we are being erased. So they don't realize that faculty and staff need accommodations, that faculty and staff are disabled. So being honest and being open, it allows more people to identify. So a lot of my students identify as disabled publicly in class now, often on the first day when we do that, like go around and introduce ourselves because I do, right? Because I make that a space to say, this is something we can talk about. Um, so I think that's helpful because more people can be like, oh, actually there are more disabled people here than I thought. Disability is not just something I can see with my eyeballs. Um, so I think that's one thing, um, of course, you know, inviting more disabled people to be speakers, to do more than just bringing in other academics. So I think that, you know, bringing in activists and cultural workers is really important. Um, and to, again, break some rules and challenge the way that we do accommodations. If you are a person who is able to provide accommodations, like in your classroom, for example, just do it. Don't wait for somebody to be like, well, here's the paperwork that tells you that they get time and a half and this and that and this. You can just, if a student says, hey, I need an extension or hey, I need this to happen in the classroom to the best of your ability within the resources that you have, because we are all working it within limited resources, do what you can, even if it doesn't fit within that little piece of paper that someone hands you that says, here's what my accommodations are based on some evaluation that some doctor did that then was passed on to somebody else who then decided this is my accommodations, having no idea what classes I'm going to be in or what they're going to be like, right? Um, so yeah, I just want people to be more creative and be more bold in the way they do things, um, because I think there is more wiggle room than we believe because we're stuck in the same rut and we don't see anybody else breaking outside of it so we get scared um so i make it my goal to break out of it a lot and remind people that you know it's okay it's all right um so again just be willing to break some rules um in order to do the thing that actually needs to be done thank you both and so for our last question um because we're Closing in on one o'clock, so we want to get to the audience Q and A as well. Um, we talked about COVID and sort of the impact that's had, and along those lines, but also kind of looking forward. Uh, once restrictions around the COVID nineteen pandemic were relaxed, there was this cultural pressure to kind of get back to the way things were before that so called return to normal. Um, we wanted to ask both of you your thoughts on things that we've learned or have done over the last three years that we should be continue doing going forward and we should carry forward and specifically thinking about ideas around accessibility and what that might look like going forward based on the sort of experience of the past three years. Oh, well, this is my list. I think that, you know, we're not in year three of this and we're still dealing with the same things that we were dealing with three years ago. I think that's the mind-boggling reality for me. You know, we're, we're debating mass, you know, we're still not doing the basic things. You know, and I look at the community, particularly those of us online, who have had our entire lives altered over the last three years. Those of us who have contracted COVID and whose quality of life has shifted. You know, those of us who are petrified of getting COVID and have not done much over the last three years while you watch the world move forward. You know, it's very disheartening here in the U.S. to watch our um, government says that, you know, come May, all the COVID provisions are going to be done with. And we still have COVID. <sighs> It's very, for me, very bleak. It's bleak because we have been failed by the powers that be, not just here in the US, because I watch a little bit of what's happening across the border too in Canada. Um, but they're failed by the people who should care to ensure that all citizens have what they need. And we have had to fight for the bare minimum, the bare minimum of a disease that you know is 
you know, it's impacting us in ways that we're not going to understand fully until it's um, decades later. So for me, it just feels very bleak right now. It feels very bleak when I see disabled folks, you know, just being angry that they're stuck in 2020 and everybody else is trying to move forward. You know, I wrote some pieces last year that really center that, you know, and I don't know what, I don't know what it's going to take for people to care about each other. Because yes, we have been failed by our governments, but we also are people. And I think just this resistance of doing basic things like getting vaccine, you know, getting masks, the resistance is just overwhelming. You know, not just to protect others, but you're also yourself, you know, and that, and it's just the cognitive dissonance. And I just don't understand it. You know, and I, you know, am very familiar with how human behavior can be you know, unique in his own way due to my background in social work and psychology. But to live in this, what I feel like a real life case study, you know, in this moment is just so upsetting. I, you know, I do my best to still protect myself, you know, as a disabled person, I'm still the only one masking in a lot of my settings. And that's just the way it's going to be. And I'm okay with that because I'm doing my small part to keep myself safe and other people safe. But I, I think the lack of care and community understanding is very profound in, within individualistic societies that we live in. And as Sammy said earlier, those of us who are of color, you know, who have to be outside due to our jobs and things of that nature, we are put at risk every day. And I think it's just a reminder that we are easily disposable in society that don't, don't count our lives to begin with. So I think that's just my outlook on things. Just, you know, if you care about your own health and those around you, continue to do what you can do. But I just don't know at this point. Um. Sammy, I, I agree that, you know, so much of what is needed is structural, right? Um, we need to return to having folks to have leave when they get COVID, right? To be able to stay home longer, get support to rest. Um, you know, we need structures of care and support. Um, and that's also financially, um, you know, like I would like us to have masks in healthcare forever. I don't know why we were in like emergency rooms and, you know, clinics without masks on them in the first place. <laughs> I don't know why we were doing that. Uh, so I think there's a lot of things that like we can just hold on to. Um, but also, yeah, I mean, I believe in a harm reduction approach um, in the wake of the lack of structural support, right? Like structural support is the main thing that we need because it makes sense to me why people who, yeah, work in a grocery store bagging groceries and have random people coughing in their face all day are like, yes, I'm going to go to a bar after work and have a drink. And I'm not going to, I'm not going to just work and have no pleasure and be forced to engage with this in the workplace. Right. So structural things that negate the need for pleasure and, and don't provide support are the main thing, but I believe in yeah, harm reduction. How can we care for each other within our particular settings? How can we talk to one another? I think that there's a lot that we learned about just being honest about our health with one another to say, hey, woke up kind of sniffly, kind of coughing, not sure what's going on. Like, can we be honest about our health with one another? Can we mask when we're just like, you know, I don't know what's going on. It doesn't matter if it's not COVID. I don't want your cold either. I don't want whatever you got. I don't want it. Bird flu apparently is coming. I don't want any of it. So if you don't think you're well and you can't stay home for whatever reasons, can you mask, right? I think that there are some things that we can just say, can we just adapt the way we're moving? It doesn't have to be all or nothing. Um, so, you know, those things, but again, I think a lot of what I'm able to do to protect myself is really a matter of class privilege. So at the university, my classes, everyone masked, but that was because I bought masks 
every day I brought masks to class that I paid for myself. And every day I was like, oh, you don't have a mask. Here you go, baby. Just every day, every day, handing them out. And that's what I did. And I bought an air filter and I bought, you know, I paid for things that kept me and my students safer, but that's not available for everyone. So again, this is also, it's just so much structural of like having access to even things like quality masks, you know, the surgical masks are not enough. And that's what I see in a lot of spaces being made available, even though I think that KN95s are actually not that much more expensive to get. Um, but they're harder for folks to find, um, especially in like the store, you know, if you're not going online, if that's not the way that you're finding your resources. So, um, yeah, I believe in harm reduction, doing the best we can. Um, you know, I feel very privileged to live in, uh, it's weird to say this, Wisconsin, but in this moment, I do just for COVID reasons, not for most other reasons, um, but because we have continued to have really quality access to testing, for example. So every month, people in the state of Wisconsin, you go online, you click a button, they send you 10 at-home tests for free every single month. I can go and walk into a clinic that is five minutes from my house and get a free PCR anytime I want, as often as I want. That is not available to most people that I know. So again, structural support also so dramatically varies place to place that I think it's really hard to say, well, this is what you should be doing in rural Alabama. And this is what you should be doing in New York City. And this is what, because these contexts are going to completely change the way we approach COVID. And I agree. I'm here in South Carolina. They do not care about us here in South Carolina. So that's why I take the initiative to wear my own mask, because mm -hmm. I know that my governor doesn't care, you know, if something happens to me and people that look like me, so wearing a mask is sometimes their own individualistic choice because you know what state you true live in, particularly states that have refused to expand healthcare or have a very shaky healthcare system before COVID, you know, the pandemic began. We already know that we are all we have and it is on mm -hmm. us to look out for ourselves. So for many of us, that harm reduction is just knowing where we are located in this country and what access that we have for ourselves and others and how can we reduce you know infection us causing someone to get sick and when our government doesn't care what happens yeah i'm gonna just like i'm not being paid to promote these things but two things that can add to like individual protection you can get a personal air fil filter i have one from pure enhancement it was like 40 bucks the filter lasts for six months and it like i don't know it's like a six foot radius of being able to help purify air. So I take that every time I travel. And then there's also this product called Nozin that is a nasal sanitizer that helps reduce the chances of infection for like 12 hours. And you just like swab inside your nose. So I do that before I go into public. That's like 25 bucks for like 50, you know, doses of that. So if other folks are really trying to reduce your personal risk, um, those are two things in addition to masks that I've added to my repertoire that has been very helpful as I've been on the road for the book tour. And I definitely and second the air filter, mm -hmm. the um, air humid humidifier. That's what I use when I travel as well. So second, I'm going to recommend for that. Thank you both for those recommendations. There's a couple of products that I, I wasn't familiar with. Um, I've done the Corsi Rosenthal box with the uh, air filters and the fans. Um, uh, we're a little bit past time, and I wanted to shift us into uh, considering some questions that the audience has put forward. Um, so if you're out there and you have a burning question, uh, please throw it into the Q&A, and we'll get to it. I've got a few here, and I, there's one I wanted to start off with. And it's from, it's anonymous attendee asks, how do the panelists feel about desirability? playing a role in how we perceive disability and those who are recognized for their disability justice activism, including this panel. Uh, they say, as acknowledged, a lot of us are erased because of desirability, and this happens across movements. And they give an example of how Rosa Parks gets the credit for uh, not moving in, in the bus, uh, but the person who did it before her was a dark-skinned Black teenage mom who refused to give up her seat on the bus. Um, how will room be made for the rest of us who are not desirable, non-academics, dark-skinned Black people, poor Black folks, folks who communicate outside of voicing out, writing out, beyond acknowledging our privilege? This is Valosa. The one thing I do is I always recommend folks 
that don't look like me. You know, I understand my privilege as a light skinned black person, you know, someone with a master's degree, uh, someone whose disability is very visible, even though I do have a hidden disability of being hard of hearing. You know, um, I understand very well what my place is uh, in this movement. You know, growing up in South Carolina, in the South, in the U.S., you understand what privilege looks like. You know, that's outside of whiteness um, when it comes to your intra-community worlds. And the same thing exists within the disability space. So I think that bringing in folks who do not have those quote-unquote privileges, those who may not have a master's or PhD, those who may not have any type of degree or diploma or so forth, you know, is very important. You know, it goes back to what I was saying about the authoritative forces, you know, like getting people to understand that the people close to the issue are the real authorities. And those of us who are able to be a certain face, you know, we have to recognize that too. We have to recognize that when you present a certain way, we look a certain way, doors and people engage with you differently. That's the reality. I have always known that, at least for me, white folks treat me differently than someone who is darker than me. You know, and that's a reality. Does it suck? Yes, it sucks. You know, I'm just going to be plain about it. It sucks. But those are the realities. And so my job as someone with privilege is to keep the door open for other people, invite them in when I know they're not going to be thought of, and to keep my a height hold on my understanding of the world around me, you know, in the way that I exist, you know, is one of the reasons why I am so vocal about things because I know that I can do that. You know, I'm not a very loud person. I always tell people like, I'm pretty quiet, but in coming to this space and looking at particularly how white folks engage certain people, I realized, oh, I have to be a certain way to get the message out because I know somebody who is, who don't look like me exactly, it's going to get hit in a whole different way than I can, than I will. So I'd rather take the punches in that way, you know, because I know what that is, what that is like. So yeah, like a lot of movie spaces, you know, just going to keep it real. A lot of the lighter skin folks are the faces, but some of the lighter skin folks are very well aware why we are the faces, you know, why we are the ones getting next to it. And also our responsibility to bring folks in. And to not just be a whole bunch of privileged looking people in the room. So I think that having that understanding before I came into this space has helped me be more intentional about that versus people who may have lived in a bubble of sorts about certain privileges or understandings. And that can be a little bit of a shock to them in coming to these spaces and then them trying to navigate it. So from my background, from where I come from and my understanding, in particular of black history and things of that nature, it's not easy. It's not, it's easy for me to understand the privileges that I have and to make room and not feel a way about it because that's just what you need to do. Yeah, I, you know, I agree with all these things. I, I fully recognize the way that how I look and how I talk, even being like as femme as I am, all of that adds into the way that I am um, read and experienced within spaces. Um, and now that I am in a position that, you know, I have tenure, I have the books out, I try to enter spaces and be, yeah, more direct, more clear, more rough about it. Cause I'm just like, I don't care. There's nothing y'all can do to me. So I'm just going to say the things. Um, so I try to use it in that way. And then I also try to really recognize when I need to shut up and when I need to step away. And this is something that Vilissa has been very helpful for me because we both get tons of like media inquiries, like, oh, can you comment on this? And can you comment on this? And can you talk to us about this? And sometimes it is not my place. It is not my place to talk about every single black disability issue that has ever existed in this world. Um, that's just not the case. And so when it is not my place to talk about something I say that and if I know someone else to point them towards I will you know I often hit up my network of people and be like oh I got asked to talk about this y'all know anybody who can talk about this you know um really trying to spread that like attention in some ways um because I try to move from like an abundance mentality that there's enough space um for all of us like we all have a place 
in this movement. We all have things that we bring to it. And I don't need to do everything because there are other people who do them very well. Um, so my goal is to can you continue to connect with people, um, to learn from folks and yeah, know who I can pass that mic to when it comes time around certain things. Um, you know, I was in a panel, uh, I don't know, earlier this week, maybe, um, that was also Canadian based, ironically. And, you know, someone asked a question about made and I, I was like, I, this is not for me to have, I, I can't tell you, you know, <laughs> like, this is not something that I can really speak intelligently on. I do not have direct experience with, um, this is not the kind of like disability experience that I have. And so, yeah, I think knowing when to shut up is important. And I would like to add to that, knowing when to shut up when it comes to things outside of your particular disability scope. And I would give an example. Uh, last summer, there was, the, you know, the uproar in the community about a certain slur being used for certain songs by certain artists, um, Black women artists like Lizzo and Beyonce. And I was approached to talk about these things. And I was very intentional about how I talked about it because the slur is not associated with my disability, my particular disability. So I was very intentional not to talk about the word. I was more intentional about talking about the anti-Blackness misogyny war um, and the fat phobia that was hurled at these artists, you know, the problematic nature of the community and engaging in these topics and conversations, because that was my lane. I think people have to realize your lane and your range. There are some things that are out of my lane and range, and I am okay with saying that even on disability topics. Not every disability topic you should be talking about and leading the conversation on. You know, it's easy to talk about things, you know, racially, you know, like, you know, if you're a white person, you, should, you know, you should need to think critically about talking about some race things that are not in your bucket. But I think sometimes our community sometimes fails to understand that there are some disability topics that you really need to know what your lane and range are. Like as somebody who's neurotypical, you're not gonna see me, you know, get into certain you know, conversations about intellectual developmental disabilities, because that's not my scope. That's not my lived experience. I don't have authoritative knowledge or voice for that. So I think that some of this conversation needs to be had with some disabled folks who, you know, extend their range beyond what it should be. And you overextend and then people get upset because you're taking up space that is not yours. You may not be able to talk about this adequately in a way that is comprehensive and nuanced. And sometimes you just need to shut up. And you do need to pass it along to somebody else who can talk about it in a more intentional, robust way than you can. So I think that, you know, some of this conversation extends within disability spaces as to knowing your place and knowing how to talk about disability and give the mic when it's time to give the mic. Thank you both for those amazing answers. Um, I'm just nodding my head like the last hour and a half. Uh, we have uh, one last question from Bellamy, which you may or may not be able to speak upon, but I thought it was an interesting question to, to bring forward. Um, they note that given the nature of queerness and secrecy, I imagine this is difficult to know, but is there any data or understanding of the number of queer folks of all very varieties who are disabled? Bellamy speaking from their perspective as being both trans and black, and it seems like almost every trans person I know is disabled. Is there research focused on the intersection of disability and queerness, transness specifically? So I'm gonna practice what I preach because this is what I found my scope and lane. So, <laughs> So I am going to pass the mic to Sammy if she has any updates. Yeah, so what I know is, so there's, you know, there's ton of like cultural stuff on queerness and disability that's out there. Um, there are edited collections. Um, Robert McGrew's Crip Theory is great for that. In terms of specifically trans and disability, there is some research. I would recommend the work of Eli Clare, white person, but still really engaging with transness and disability and particularly the um the challenging conversations that sometimes happen within the trans community about whether or not to understand transness, gender dysphoria in particular as disability, right? There are a lot of trans folks that are like, nope, my transness is not a disability. And there are other people that are like, absolutely it is. Um, so there are some resources on that. I There's one article in particular that 
I'm blanking on, but uh, I will try to look it up. Um, but one thing, one study that I th- know of is specifically on transness and autism that is finding that there's like a lot of correlation a lot of trans folks are also autistic vice versa um and not that there's been like a definitive reason why but kind of the idea that I'm that the study suggests at least is that um you know a lot of autistic folks like don't work within or as some people would say understand but I think just are like I don't like that, uh, certain kind of social norms, right? And so if we understand gender as a social norm, it might make sense that for a lot of autistic folks, they're like, gender is whatever. Like this whole thing is whatever. This doesn't make sense to me. And I'm gonna approach it in a totally different way. Um, so that there is some research, but it is still fairly limited right now. And I would say that none of it that I've seen takes in consider race at all. If we're talking transness and disability, there's no conversation about race within those conversations. Thank you so much for that. Um, And I'm sorry to say, but just keeping an eye on the clock, I'm going to wrap up now. And I wanna just uh, thank everybody for a really thought provoking uh, and and nuanced conversation. It's been really fantastic. And of course, I really wanna thank Phylissa and Sammy uh, so much for being here today, so much for opening up this series uh, of conversations on access. Uh, We really appreciate you being here. Uh, So a a big thank you for your contributions. And of course, I'd also like to thank our audience for being with us uh, and for chiming in in the chat. Uh, I'm so glad you could be here and I really hope everybody uh, stays tuned and is in touch because we have other conversations coming up in May and September. So please keep an eye on the Faculty of Information and Media Studies website for further details on those events. Uh, So that's it. Thank you again, everybody, and have a great day.